So a little while back, I was submitting my first ever paper to a technical journal. And that's pretty nerve-wracking. Nearly a year of work that I have to boil down to a few pages, which may or may not get accepted. The first thing I do is head on over to the style guide for this particular journal. And it's full of a bunch of boilerplate rules. I don't know, use this font, italicize your headings, format your references like this, that sort of thing. But then I get to the section on formatting your figures. And this is the example image. But that wasn't the weirdest part. At the end of this section, there is one tiny, inconspicuous paragraph that was the opposite of boring. Use of the Lena image in OSA journals. Authors are encouraged to avoid use of the Lena image. Authors who submit manuscripts to OSA journals that include the Lena image will be asked to justify the scientific necessity of using the image, and why no reasonable substitute can be made. Other standard test images include Cameraman, Mandrill, or Peppers. If you don't recognize them, Mandrill and Peppers belong to the University of Southern California's Test Image Library. These images, as benign as they look, have helped to shape so much of the digital world that you're using right now. A set of 512 by 512 pixel images that were shared and distributed between many, many labs in order to compare their various signal processing algorithms. Some images were chosen because they're familiar concepts like humans and food. Others were chosen because they represent interesting challenges for computers. Lots of detail, variation in light levels and shadows, and sharp transitions. All of them, in some way or another, were used to help define the JPEG. And this Lena image also belongs to this library of images. Or at least it used to. Heading over to USC's image library, you'll see a note at the top saying that the Lena image, alongside four others, is no longer distributed by them. Although these images have played a significant role in the history of image processing, they no longer represent the best examples for future research. So why is there a specific rule against it now? I had never heard of the Lena image before, and I can't imagine what it could be that necessitated an entire dedicated rule against it. I can think of a few other images that would get my paper rejected. How about a giant Or I don't know, someone sitting on a park wearing a But those are more common sense, and I don't think they needed rules specifically targeting them. I checked too, it's not just this one journal. Several journals have issued similar rules, or at the very least, made statements urging authors to consider alternatives. So what is the Lena image? Well, here it is. A woman in a fancy feathered hat giving you a look. Huh. To explain this, we need to go back to the summer of 1973. We're at the University of Southern California in the Signal and Image Processing Institute. The first ever digital image was 16 years old by that point. At that time, the lab was looking to generate a new set of standardized test images to replace the boring ones from the 60s. These were all eventually replaced by stuff like Mandrill and Peppers. But their most famous image by several orders of magnitude was Lena. On this particular day, they really just had two criteria. A. They wanted a glossy image, because glossy surfaces provide good dynamic range, which is the difference in brightness between the lightest and darkest spots on an image. And B. They wanted a human face, because humans are really good at recognizing when something is wrong with a human face. If an image algorithm messed something up, we'd know right away due to the uncanny valley. And that day, their prime candidate fell into their lap. A grad student walked in with the November 1972 edition of Playboy. The centerfold that month was of a Swedish model named Lena Sutterberg. Blurred for obvious reasons. Lena's name is only spelled with one N, by the way, but she asked that her name be printed with two so no one would mispronounce it as Lena. So they tore off the top one third of the centerfold and gave it a scan. It wasn't a perfect scan. The image was slightly stretched and the very top line of pixels was missing, so the team just copied the top line to get an even 512 rows. And that was that. Back in these days, electronic scanners were not at all commonplace, so many labs sharing and distributing the same small number of test images was understandable. But the reuse of Lena's image goes far beyond the years where digital scanning was hard to come by. Some of the technical reasons you'll hear are the following. The feather on her hat has a lot of fine detail. There are several sections with different levels of shading. The foreground and background of the image have different levels of focus. Lena became what is quite possibly the most widely used image in all of academia. Lena is on the cover of at least a few textbooks. The Lena photo is one of the very first images that was uploaded to ARPANET, precursor to the modern internet. If you can consider something as going viral back then, Lena is a prime candidate. It would likely take years of cataloging to track down every single usage of the Lena image to get an accurate total. 
Thankfully, a team has already done much of that work. Jennifer Ding, Jen Diem, and Michelle McGee over at The Pudding compiled a chronological count of the Lena image ever since its first appearance in 1972. I will say that because their methodology depends so heavily on digitized versions of old papers, that the 1970s and 80s are probably going to be severely undercounted, since many paper journals would not have been preserved online. Nonetheless, you can pinpoint the exact moment that Lena went from niche to a phenomenon. After it was first digitized in 1973, Lena has a slow decade and a half. Up until 1985, each year there may be only one or two papers featuring Lena, and some years zero. But in 1986, a shift happens. A slow uptick in Lena appearances, and in 1989, we're above 20. And then 1990 goes quiet, but I have a feeling this is an outlier that is missing a bunch of undigitized papers. It's 1991 where everything changes. Throughout the 70s and 80s, the Lena image was able to fly under the radar, appearing in articles and various technical websites. Nothing big, nothing fancy. But in June 1991, the journal Optical Engineering went a step further and put Lena and Peppers on their cover. This led to an explosion of uses for the Lena image. Compared to the last peak, the uses tripled going over 60. This prompted a vaguely threatening letter from Playboy basically saying that, hey, uh, we saw that you used one of our centerfolds as a cover. Don't do that. We're gonna give you a pass this time, but we will not be so lenient in the future. The editor-in-chief then basically told all potential authors to avoid using the Lena image, and in general, to ensure that they had the necessary permissions to any copyrighted material they wanted to use. Of course, this had the opposite effect, and researchers doubled down. 1992 saw a small bump, and then in 1993 it nearly doubled. And in 1994 it almost did it again. The absolute peak of the Lena phenomenon was in 1995 with over 280 instances recorded in Google Scholar, which, again, is likely undercounting the actual figure. After this, you see a big drop-off in 1996, and it stays relatively low until it picks up again in the 2000s, and proceeds to fluctuate around those levels even to this day, with a huge bump just last year. Clearly, Playboy's copyright threats did nothing to stop the propagation of Lena. At some point during the 90s, Playboy had done a 180 on enforcing their copyright. When asked about it in 1997, their VP of New Media had this to say, We decided we should exploit this, because it is a phenomenon. I feel like any other word than exploit would have been a better choice here. It's easy to see why they gave up. The November 1972 issue of Playboy is the fourth highest selling issue of Playboy ever. 7.2 million copies. Still though, there was a significant drop off in usage immediately after the peak year, and copyright aside, there has to be a reason that there are now rules against using the image. Let's zoom in on 1996 and take a look at the journal IEEE Transactions on Image Processing. If you want a journal all about image processing, there you go. In just that year alone, 57 of their articles had Lena in it. That's 30% of all their articles that year. One in three contained Lena. The editor-in-chief, David Munson, kicked off that year with an editorial. A note on Lena. During my term as editor-in-chief, I was approached a number of times with the suggestion that the journal should consider banning the use of the image of Lena. Munson then goes on to describe the Playboy origins, why some people think that it sends the wrong message, and why he suspects the industry adopted the image so enthusiastically. First, the image contains a nice mixture of detail, flat regions, shading, and texture that do a good job of testing various image processing algorithms. Second, the Lena image is a picture of an attractive woman. It is not surprising that the mostly male image processing research community gravitated towards an image that they found attractive. He then makes the buckwild decision to follow up that sentence with a fun fact about how the Lena image is featured in the movie Sleeper, which stars Woody Allen. I fucking can. Oh my god. And before you check the timeline, because I know you want to, I assure you, it does not make this any less cringe. Munson follows this up by explaining that he's heard a wide diversity of opinions on this issue, including from one woman who's self-described as a feminist who said that this political correctness stuff infuriates me. He also makes a point of saying that the majority of people who came to him about the issue were men. Now, and hear me out here, have you considered that you mostly got feedback from men because you work in a field predominantly filled with men. 
and that the few women who do work in the field with you are only still there because they've learned not to rock the boat on issues like this. Now, I also wanted to hear a diversity of opinions on this issue, and although this isn't a massive sample by any means, I'm sure you'll appreciate hearing from someone who isn't me for this entire video. I have, I feel like my thoughts are kind of hard to untangle on this because um, there's just like a lot of aspects to this issue. I mean, I, I'm pro the realization now that we probably shouldn't be using like a sexualized image um, in like papers or for like image processing and like the implications that has on like um, like women in the field. It, I could see how it would be normal for like the guy in the first place to be like, oh, let's just use this image. But the fact that it got so far is kind of the alarming part. As an outsider, you it's hard to understand like a tradition when you're not part of it. So a lot of people who really don't like the image don't understand like the use of it. But I think when you're part of a tradition, it's also really easy to get stuck on something that might not really be useful to you anymore. Uh, like this image is old enough that it's not incredibly useful as an engineering tool anymore, but people are still using it. So like looking at the picture, you can tell it's a good picture. It's literally just the cropped image of like, it's like a woman's portrait. Um, so looking at that, I was like, yeah, I mean, I don't know why like you would have such a push to retire it, but I get like that, you know, having the, the picture in like the male gazy perspective and like the origins of it are problematic. Like the image she explained had elicited sexual comments from the boys in her class and its continuing inclusion in the curriculum was evidence of a broader culture issue. I think like the picture is not eliciting the sexual comments because of its origins, it's eliciting the sexual comments because of the culture issue. Now again, this op-ed was from 1996, and I want to give it at least a little bit of credit where it's due. Munson ends his opinion with a call for a compromise. Although he was not in favor of an outright ban on the image because he didn't want to establish a precedent, he was also sympathetic to those that wanted to retire the image. In cases where another image will serve your purposes equally well, why not use that other image? After all, why needlessly upset colleagues. He argues that the use of the image would likely decline on its own, with or without any explicit rules against it. And he was right about that. Let's take the same journal, Transactions on Image Processing. In 2015, it saw 38 articles with the Lena image. Sounds like a lot, but the percentage of articles has dropped significantly. It's down from 30% to 6.2% annually. Now, whether you agree with the ethical arguments, and we absolutely are going to get to those, there is also a compelling technical argument for retiring the image. As pointed out by Munson in his closing sentence, and who knows, we may even devise image compression schemes that work well across a broader class of images, instead of being tuned to just Lena. The overuse of the Lena image is a pretty blatant example of tradition for the sake of tradition. Think about it, in a field that is all about algorithms for processing images, if you spend most of your time training against the same image over and over, all you've proven is that your algorithm works for Lena. Think about every AI used to identify different objects. The only learn based off the images that its developers feed into it. If you give it nothing but pictures of dogs, it's not going to identify you a dolphin. In the years since Munson's editorial, several past editors for the journal have expressed renewed interest in retiring the Lena image. Here's a quote from Scott Acton. In 2016, demonstrating that something works on Lena isn't really demonstrating that the technology works. Lena contains 250,000 pixels, some 32 times smaller than a picture snapped with an iPhone 6. And then there's a quality problem. The most commonly used version of the image is a scan of a printed page. The printing process doesn't produce a continuous image, but rather a series of dots that trick your eyes into seeing continuous tones and colors. Those dots, Acton says, mean that the scanned Lena image isn't comparable to photos produced by modern digital cameras. Basically, Lena was a good test image in the 70s, but at a time when we have watches smarter than a 1970s supercomputer, Lena is out of date, and it goes beyond just quality issues. In 2011, Michael Wirth and Denis Nikitenko wrote a whole conference paper on what they call worn out test images, and have a whole section devoted to Lena. Part of the argument for using Lena is that it's standardized. If everyone is using the exact same image, you have a clear frame of reference for different algorithms. But that's not quite true. The original version of the Lena image is this one, in color. 
the majority of papers are done using a grayscale version of Lena. But you can make a grayscale version of Lena in a lot of different ways. Here are four different decomposition techniques used to produce a grayscale version of the image. Now, take those pixels and plop them on a histogram, where you count the different pixel brightnesses. Do these look the same to you? Just because an image of Lena looks the same to the human eye doesn't mean it's the same to a computer. The other big problem is that Lena is not a jack-of-all-trades test image. Sure, it has good detail, nice shading, etc, etc, but for specific types of tests, that isn't useful. Michael and Dennis bring up an example of a paper that was testing a bimodal thresholding algorithm. The idea being is that if an image has two very noticeable peaks in its brightness, the algorithm should be able to identify that. Do any of these histograms look bimodal to you? They aren't, they have lots of different peaks. This is just Lena being used because she's famous, not because she's a good choice for this algorithm. Another example is an algorithm designed to remove streaks and scratches from an image. Rather than using an image that actually has a scratch on it, the paper instead adds an artificial one to Lena. Another paper does a similar thing, but instead adds artificial noise to Lena. As they say in their paper, image processing algorithms should be tested on realistic images within the problem domain. Finally, their next section has possibly my favorite section title out of any paper I've ever read. Section 6. How to alleviate worn out images. Solution number 1. Don't use them. Alright, moving on. They end their paper with an excellent summary. The use of Lena was fine when there were limited digital images available for testing. However, it is difficult to make that claim anymore. Researchers should move beyond the comfort zone of these historical test images and help design publicly available standardized databases of images which can be used for evaluating algorithms. And look, I get it. Maybe even that is still not enough to convince some of you. You don't have to look very hard to find people infuriated at the idea of retiring Lena. First off, you have the run-of-the-mill misogynistic horseshit. I love how weak they all sound. Maybe they need to find a big strong patriarchy to come and save them. Hmm? I wouldn't be surprised if in another 50 years carrots and bananas will be banned for being too phallic. Why work in something practical like cutting-edge technologies when you can do the fashionable thing and regurgitate the latest line from half-literate university apparachicks? Incredibly brave. Not today, fascist nerds. Those women look embarrassingly weak. Do you know why they waste time for artificial issues like this one? because they are trying to fill up emptiness of their lives. I mean, as an engineering, uh, recent engineering graduate myself, the issue with engineering culture um, towards women is a very multifaceted problem. And it isn't just one big issue. There are so many very tiny problems. If there is one specific tiny problem that affects you very strongly, and you feel that pushing against that one tiny problem and maybe making headway might make you feel better about the culture issues, then by all means do it, right? Like there's so many little small things and if we change all of these little small things, then they make these very big changes in the culture. Kind of think too that it is a little bit of like waste of resources to be hyper focused on this image. It's just like two completely separate things. It's not it's not really comparable and like, oh, we shouldn't retire this image because it doesn't really help. That's like true. It doesn't help the crux of the issues, but that's not really a reason for not retiring a certain image that also has roots in kind of like male centric uh, workplaces. Yeah, I'm I'm in the side of things where it's like it's worth spending the effort fixing this because it's just one little like brick in the wall, basically, in like the way, in the good way, not in like the insignificant way. <laughs> Odds are you've met people like this, but they know well enough to keep their mouths shut in real life. But besides these idiots, there is one common sentiment that I see a lot of. So true. Besides, the picture is a piece of history and should not be erased. Reject history and make the same errors in the future. It's used in so much more. This is a bad idea, Kevin. I don't know. Here's an idea. Let geeks code or whatever with whatever source they choose. Whammon. If y'all are so incensed by that image, 
Use another one. Stop with the censorship. Book burning has never worked. Book burning, huh? Wow. Whew. That's a little extreme. The way these guys talk, they act like there's someone calling for all the old papers to be erased or retracted, for authors to be blacklisted from journals. Literally no one is saying that. It's just a push to use different images moving forward. It's this bizarre complex where even the most inoffensive request to alter the status quo by even an inch are treated as an attempt to erase history. But you know what? Okay, sure, I agree. There's a lot of the history of computer science that has been intentionally ignored and underdocumented, and it would be nice to change that. The word computer, in its earliest definition, did not refer to a machine, electronic, electromechanical, or just plain mechanical. It meant a person who computes, someone whose job was to sit down and grind out tedious number crunching to solve problems. And the vast majority of these human computers were women. Even as far back as the 1800s, women have been intertwined with the world of computer science. Ada Lovelace is widely credited as the first computer programmer, having created the first ever algorithm to be run by Charles Babbage's hypothetical analytical engine. Grace Hopper is known for inventing the first compiler, a way to convert human readable words into machine readable ones and zeros. This eventually became the first programming language, COBOL. She also coined the term computer bug when a literal moth got stuck in the Harvard Mark II. Margaret Hamilton, coder for the Apollo mission that landed on the moon. Katherine Johnson performed the calculations for NASA's first ever human flight. Lena has been called the patron saint of JPEGs, but really that title should go to Joan L. Mitchell. She co-created the JPEG format at IBM and was the mind behind the compression algorithm that JPEGs still use today. Now, highlighting exceptional individual women in the field is one thing, but to focus entirely on them just perpetuates the misleading concept of lone geniuses. It's also key to recognize the many millions of women who were the backbone of the early computing movement from the early 1900s up to the 1960s. If you want a great book on this topic, I highly recommend Programmed Inequality by Mar Hicks. To quote the first chapter here, when women do not fulfill the role of inventor or entrepreneur in a way comparable to the men, their labor is often regarded as not being integral to the main narrative of computing's history. As a class of workers in the 19th and early 20th centuries, women had lower rates of trade union participation, less flexibility and control over where and when to work, and less ability to demand higher rates of pay. As such, they were often hired for jobs involving work with machines, labor that was considered tedious, menial, and unworthy of a salary that could support a family. In the 1880s, Harvard's Edward Pickering hired dozens of women as computers in order to track and catalog nearly 10,000 stars. He recognized that the women were just as competent as men for this sort of work, but of course there's the added bonus that he could hire them for less than the average factory worker. The earliest telephone switchboards consisted of a series of cables that were manually plugged and unplugged, and the vast majority of operators were women. Women in the US, including a large number of black women segregated into different rooms, performed the majority of ballistics computing for World War II. Similarly, Britain's top secret unit to break Germany's Enigma code was nearly 80% women. Many of the women who worked on it were sworn to secrecy, and when asked what their jobs were, they were told to just say they were secretaries. Many of these women are long dead now, and their names lost to history. The programmers for the world's first fully programmable electronic computer, ENIAC, were six female mathematicians. These terms didn't quite exist yet, but hardware was considered men's work and software was considered woman's work. The men who designed ENIAC would tell the women what they wanted it to do, and the ENIAC 6 would write out long series of punch cards, which they would then have to manually slot into the machine and then have to debug one vacuum tube at a time. After the war, when many women left industries that they had supported while men were in combat, a large number of women actually stayed in computing. Contrary to what you might think today, women were actively sought out for computing jobs in the 50s and 60s. If you needed to calculate payroll for your company, you bought some of the earliest computers from IBM. And to operate those machines, you generally hired a woman. One of them would have included my grandmother. If you look at the marketing for office computers in the 60s and 70s, it was a lot of, uh, hey, look at this pretty woman who can do all these things. Psst, with the help of a computer. Think of how many staff you could lay off and instead just underpay one person. Employers simply looked for candidates who were logical, good at math, and meticulous. And in this respect, gender stereotypes worked in women's favor. Some executives argued that women's traditional expertise at painstaking activities like knitting and weaving manifested precisely this mindset. A book from 1968, 
your career in computers, stated that people who like cooking from a cookbook make good programmers. The burgeoning computing industry was obviously still riddled with discrimination. Fields where men and women held the exact same jobs were subject to laws like Britain's Equal Pay Act of 1955. But because early computing jobs were so segregated by gender, there were often no men and women sharing the exact same job title so there was no pay disparity to equalize. Employers were in no rush to fix this. Women were still absent from management positions, and some women would even train men who would later become their bosses. And there was the whole thing where you could be fired for getting pregnant or married. And yet, the computer industry was one of the first white collar jobs that offered women any upwards class mobility. In 1967, Cosmopolitan noted in an article that women said they could earn up to $170,000 a year in today's money. So it should be no surprise that as soon as women were afforded any upwards class mobility, even through a very narrow type of career path, the labor market would do a 180 and cut off that avenue. It's actually pretty easy to zero in on the inflection point where the trend of women in computing started to do a nosedive, at least in the United States. Throughout the 70s, the participation of women in computing degrees effectively doubled, and the peak was the 1983 to 1984 academic year with 37.1 of computer science graduates being women. Since then, the proportions fell off a cliff. In 2010, that percentage was just 17.6%. And this trend isn't seen in other STEM fields. If you compare computer science to medicine, the physical sciences, or even law school, those programs kept increasing and eventually plateaued. And of course, biases still exist in those fields too, but clearly something is different about computer science. So what happened? Well, the 80s marked the first decade where the average home could afford to buy home computers. Prior to this, anyone who showed up to their first day of university was assumed to have zero knowledge of computers. They may never have even touched one before, but that didn't matter. Everyone would be taught from the ground up. But home computers weren't marketed equally. In the movies, the stereotypical hacker was a white guy. Computers were sold as toys for boys, so boys got them as birthday and Christmas gifts to practice on at a young age. And many young girls did not. This data comes from a study run by Jane Margolis in the latter half of the 90s. For example, boys were more than twice as likely to have been given a computer as a gift by their parents. And if parents bought a computer for the family, they most often put it in a son's room, not a daughter's. So when that same generation of boys and girls made it to their freshman year of university, many of the boys already knew the basics of programming, but the girls did not, and they were left to play catch up on their own time. It's a feedback loop. Girls drop out of computer science, so no need to advertise computers to them. The thing is, one of the other trends that Margolis saw was that even when female students were getting fantastic grades, they would still drop out of the program. Dozens of male classmates with much worse grades would go on to graduate. It wasn't a meritocracy. The idea was, you would just have to love being with a computer all the time, and if you don't do it 24-7, you're not a real programmer. Oh, you code of C++? Name three of their albums. And then we get to the harassment. When a woman contradicted another student, you'd often hear something like, you sure are bitchy today, must be on your period. And when a program has only one or two women, gee, I don't think it's fair that the only two girls in the group are in the same office. We should share. And maybe this next one will connect a few dots. When some men at Carnegie Mellon were asked to stop using pictures of naked women as desktop wallpaper on their computers, they angrily complained that it was censorship of the sort practiced by the Nazis or the Ayatollah Khomeini. Huh. Sounds familiar. To quote Mar Hicks here, In 1973, at the moment that Lena's picture was being brought into the lab, there were hundreds if not thousands of women being pushed out. All this happened for a reason. If they hadn't used a Playboy centerfold, they almost certainly would have used another picture of a pretty white woman. The Lena image is not the problem in and of itself. If there was no systemic imbalance between boys and girls in computer science, then yeah, who cares? No need to worry about one image. But that's not the system we live in. I think the most important voice in this as to like whether it should be retired or not is Lena's. Like if she does not want her her likeness in this sense like continually used, I feel like it's really important to listen to her. Lena was photographed for Playboy in 1972. Following this, she was invited to the Playboy Mansion, but she declined to come meet the grease ball that was Hugh Hefner and his terrible rope. After this, Lena then divorced her husband, did some modeling for Kodak, but soon quit the industry altogether. That world was not for her. Quick aside here that this is not a judgment on Lena or 
any woman who has made their career in Playboy modeling or any similar career. Lena is extremely proud of that photo, and she has every reason to be. When she returned to Sweden, she got remarried, had a kid, and worked as a public servant for decades. She spent her years teaching computer use to people with disabilities. I think, like, to me, the most important part is that Lena herself is okay with the image being used, that she's not upset that people are using it. She was not asked for her consent when they started using the image for engineering purposes. But in asking her down the road, she has said that she wasn't upset about it. She didn't think there was a problem with it. And that since it was cut at her shoulder, she didn't think it was scandalous or anything. In 1997, she was the guest of honor at a conference in Boston, where she was honored as the patron saint of JPEGs. According to this article, she had never used the internet before, so she was gobsmacked by the amount of people who knew her. They gave her an engraved clock, which she still has to this day. In 2015, she went to Quebec City for another conference, this time presiding over an awards banquet for the field of image processing. Uh, when you first mentioned it to me, I thought it was kind of going to be more of like a stigmatization issue about this one person. Surprisingly, I think in the industry treated her better than I expected. Like I think now it's kind of like for people um, I've seen others describe it as kind of like legendary to meet her or like she's she's treated like an icon rather than like uh, like a like a playmate or like a playboy kind of figure instead. So uh, in terms of where she is now, I, I mean, I've also heard that she was pro retiring the image and I totally get that as well. You're at like this other stage in your life and people are still like using your your image over and over and over again. In 2019, a reporter for Wired tracked her down and met her in her hometown. They told her about the recent push to retire the image. Lennon was shocked and upset to hear that her image may have had that effect. She assumed because the photo was just from the shoulders up that it wouldn't be a big deal. When I read about the girl in the class with all the boys, I can understand that she was the only girl. And well, boys talk. Maybe they'd been looking at the whole picture. Later that year, Lena joined up with an Australian documentary crew. Losing Lena is the film they produced together. To end this, I'll leave you with a message from Lena herself. I'm Lena. I retired from modeling a long time ago. It's time I retired from tech too.